Warm greetings on behalf of W for W Foundation. Welcome to another session of Friday Waters. The idea of Friday Waters is to wet the Fridays with fun and yet get fruitful content for the better understanding about the water matters in different possible ways, apart from scientific ways, of course. Uh, Friday Waters, uh, Waters has water talkies, book reading, which is today, thesis club and water art session. So these are like once in a month session. So the focus of book reading session, which is today, um, is to bring authors or author, sometimes like today we have to share, sir, who have written books, novels, comics, etc., on the water matters in order to discuss with them the making of the book or the novel or comic and issues around the subject they have covered in their manuscript. Besides um, being, bringing interest in the water conversation, the session will also increase the outreach of the book in the water networks as well as society at large. Today, we shall discuss uh, the making of the book, namely Taming the Anarchy, uh, Groundwater Governance in South Asia. And to do the honor, we have Tushar Shah, Tushar Shah, who is the author of this uh, 2009 published book by Routledge, uh, Taylor and Francisco. Let me just provide you some basic details of the book, uh, Taming the Anarchy, Groundwater Governance in South Asia, before I invite Tushar Shah to speak and interact with us. Um, the hardcover book is 300 pages, so I received it almost a month ago, so I, I was reading it really seriously, but quite heavy book to be honest for me, who is uh, not so academically oriented, uh, weighing nearly 730 grams and measuring 15.6, uh, 1.9 and 23.3 uh, centimeters, so it's a thick book, huh? but I have a PDF version, so I'm really blessed. Uh, the book uh, is cited 823 times by many international journal articles and books. It is available for sale in Routledge as well as in Amazon. And I'm going to share the link in the chat box very soon. Now, a little bit introduction about uh, Tushar Shah sir, who actually does not need, but still as a protocol of the session, I must do that. He is a very well-known economist and public policy specialist and uh, currently holding senior emeritus uh, scientist at the International Water Management Institute, which is IMI. And he works out of Anand, which is uh, in Gujarat in India. He's former he is former director of the Institute of Rural Management at Anand, which is IRMA. With over 35 years, his main research interests have been in water institutions and policies in South Asia, a subject on which he has extensively published and we are also going to talk about it today in the context of groundwater. Uh, he's honored with many awards, for example, one of the Outstanding Scientist Award with CGIAR uh, in 2002. And he's in the board of many academic institutions, NGOs and other organizations, just to give you a name that ICICI Bank Board as well. So welcome to Shah sir. It's really a privilege to have you on board and also we are very keen to hear from you uh, about the book and little bit details around the subject in the context of today because the book is nearly 15 years ago. And um, before I really uh, make you uh, do the opening remarks of the book, I just want to uh, tell all our participants a little bit about the book as I looked at it. I also understood from the basic reviews which have been come, which has come from the book. As we all know, the issues of groundwater in South Asia have been in existence for a very long time, including India, which is one of the leading extractors of groundwater in the world, and also facing depletion as well as pollution. The book categorically addresses the colonial period and throws light on uh, post-colonial um, and throws light on the modern day conflicts arising from the shrinking possibilities of avail availability and quality of groundwater. Um, you may be aware that the declaration of day zero of many Indian cities is actually also based on availability of groundwater in the country. But he talks more about the South Asia taking the, um, uh, you know, the bigger India we had during uh, independence about uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India together and that he has covered in his book. So post British era, which is the world's largest centrally managed canal irrigation we had that time this combined these three countries. There was also a rise in the, uh, you know, vast atomistic, he writes that, system of widely dispersed tube wells which are drawing groundwater without any permits and hindrances, basically do each his own kind of way, which is now, if I look at it today, has reached, reached its extreme to the stage of extinction of groundwater. I use this word very, very harshly. Uh, the book Taming uh, the Anarchy is about this growing anarchy which started then 
and he captures it beautifully along with the large irrigation system and the development of the chaos and the prospects of bringing it under control. So we will dig more into it, but uh, let us just hear from Tushar Shah sir. Your opening remarks on making of the book, sir. How did you come up with this idea of anarchy when we were just getting independence and, you know, and we started writing from that time that how we started already getting our groundwater in an independent mode. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, sir. Please go ahead. The, you know, when, uh, when I was working on this book, the water discussion in uh, India as well as the water policy making yes. in India was steeped in the colonial era. Yes. We, still, we still believe most of our, our water policy makers used to think that India in 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s irrigated its agriculture in much the same way as it did in the colonial era. Yes. In the colonial era, most of the irrigation used to take place through large canal irrigation projects, which the colonial government had, <coughs> had uh, constructed. And before colonial era, also India has been a, a la very large uh, and long irrigating society. We've always depended on uh, water management for ensuring food security of our people. So we have actually gone through three phases, one of adaptive irrigation during the pre-colonial -colon era. Uh, during the colonial era, era, we had large, very large basin scale projects, which were constructed by the colonial government, primarily the, with a view to, it, to enhancing land revenue. You know, land was the only source of income. People as well as uh, kings used to leave off the land. Uh, and therefore, the British government invested in irrigation as a commercial enterprise because they wanted to extract greater land revenue from farmers. In 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the government of India planning commission continued to focus on the same large-scale canal irrigation projects. However, since early 1950s, the nature of Indian irrigation had been silently changing. And uh, by 1970s and 1980s, a few people realized that uh, large irrigation projects were not really the mainstay of Indian agriculture, that most of the Indian farmers, or far more, many more farmers depended on small private tube bills for their irrigation requirements than large public irrigation projects. So if you look at the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, five-year plans, you will find that uh, the government of India's focus still was on building new irrigation projects, rehabilitating old irrigation projects. Even today, uh, most state governments allocate a large proportion of their water budget on building uh, large surface irrigation. irrigation. Yeah, but the nature of Indian irrigation has changed profoundly. In fact, in uh, the last 50 years, farmers through their own investment created four times more irrigation than governments have created over the past 250 years. Only that shows you the significance of the change that has that has occurred. And when we talked about uh, agricultural water policy, irrigation policy, uh, in those days, groundwater was never on the scene. So when I joined uh, uh, International Water Management Institute in the, in the seminar that we used to give, I used to tell the EB researchers that uh, we keep focusing on canal irrigation, but yes. actually... Look at, uh, look at how farmers irrigate in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Tarai. It's basically, you know, millions of small little tube bills through which they irrigate. So through these tube bills, they've actually won independence from, from the public irrigation. So it was basically this that I wanted to, I, I wanted to highlight. I was working, I was running a very vibrant uh, research program called Imi Tata Water Policy Program. Yes. In which I had, uh, you know, um, a dozen or a dozen and a half uh, youngsters were working, with very bright young people were working with me. And we were trying to see, understand how the irrigation economy actually functions. So actually this book is, uh, although I have written it, it's actually an output of a large number of, you know, scores of, of young students who did, uh, you know, large number of small studies that I, so it's actually more a synthesis 
of the research of, of many, many people. And its core objective was to bring, was to, was to bring into bold relief the actual nature of the Indian irrigation economy and the nature of water challenges that the country is facing. You know, when International Water Management Institute in 1980s was set up first, at that time, the world was primarily occupied with, uh, you know, bringing, mobilizing large amount of capital for building irrigation systems so that India, countries like India and Pakistan, and uh, they can produce enough food for themselves. But uh, by the end of the millennium, by the start of the new millennium, millennium the character of the irrigation economy has changed and our policies needed to be realigned to this new reality. Yes. That was the objective of, uh, of this book. Yeah. Interesting, because you, you do start uh, acknowledging ma many contributors, which you also talk about that these are small narratives, which has been knit by you in the form of this manuscript, where you talk about Frank Price Furman, whom we have also referred during our PhD work. And um, of course, uh, Sudhir Rao sir from uh, Tata Trust, who you are giving due acknowledgement right in the first few lines of your you know preface and all. Um, when you were talking about these small narratives and uh, rightfully, as you mentioned, that farmers feel much more uh, free and it goes uh, with the values of freedom because when we got uh, freedom and at the same time, there was this rise of irrigation uh, at a, you know, individual scale, I would say, or, you know, based on everyone's uh, uh, affordability or accessibility to it. And thanks to the technologies which were coming then, so you make a statement that irrigation makes you free, you know, through these uh, small tube wells and bore wells. Uh, and uh, absolutely uh, right in that sense. Uh, but if I look at uh, from that point where it was, you know, few people indulging into uh, doing this, you know, getting liberated from the large canal system and taking their own course of you know, extracting uh, groundwater or empowering themselves to draw their groundwater uh, to the state where we have really reached, uh, where it is now a collectively made, individually made a collective disaster, you know, to, uh, to that extent. So, I mean, we may say that, uh, you know, we have really uh, reached out a poor collective uh, groundwater resource management in, in, in that whole pretext of anarchy. Uh, what will be your take on this if we look at this span of 76 years or probably a little bit more because uh, tube wells had started before uh, independence already but uh, probably got registered as, as a way through science uh, in that time. I haven't read anything written in that time but I would like to know from you. Was it already getting noticed that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's rising in a lot, um, lot of places across the country? Uh, so, joint India then. So I think we realized the need for water governance long after the problem of uh, or the challenge of water governance had already become intractable. Yes. You now we began talking about uh, about registering tube wells, about regulating tube wells. Okay. okay. But but by the time we we began to talk about this, we already had several million tube wells. Yes. Now I think uh, if you if you go back to the debate on uh, on uh, groundwater governance in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was dominated dominated heavily by the experience of countries like the United States and Australia yes. and to some extent Spain. Now these are the countries where which also have a large groundwater economy, but the number of groundwater users are fewer and the average yes. ticket size is much larger. In India, the, or in South Asia in general, the number of users uh, is very, very large. Many and more. the average ticket size is very small. And the cost of registration, the cost of regulation is, it varies not with the size of the groundwater economy, but with the number of people, independent decision makers who are involved in appropriating and using groundwater. So soon we realized that uh, governing groundwater in South Asia is a different ball, ball game altogether. And all the lectures that we were getting from the World Bank and from the Australian and American policymakers who would come and uh, you know teach us how to replicate their experience, eventually we found that uh, that it just won't work. And it yeah. was that in, in that sense that I use the term anarchy. 
yes. that uh, the, the American and the Australians were used to a groundwater regime in which every agricultural tuber was measured, was metered, when uh, pumping by every farmer uh, was recorded in, in real time, and therefore you could direct the behavior of every farmer. So in, for example, in Kansas and in Texas and many states of Western US where large uh, amount of groundwater is used for irrigation. Every farmer is very closely monitored. And they yes. also look at what is happening in the aquifer because of groundwater drought by farmers and the local groundwater committees, they regulate the behavior of farmers. Now they wanted us to do that here, but we found that doing that here in our context was extremely difficult simply because we already had 16, 17, 18 million independent tuber owners who were neither registered, we didn't even know uh, where they were and there was no way of you know, charging a price and so forth. So it was, that was really uh, the anarchy that I was talking about. Yes, interesting because um, when we talk about these uh, countries which were uh, developed by uh, the 1990s, 2000, when we started talking about how do we now regulate uh, this transition from oil which we have reached uh, by um, our inability to really monitor who is uh, digging how many times and where. Uh, uh, in your chapters, um, so just uh, for all the participants, let me just take uh, quickly through uh, the layout of the book. So the book has seven chapters, excluding the introduction, and uh, you must read how it is well laid out and how introduction really explains why these chapters come one after the other. Uh, so let me just uh, quickly get the chapter layout so that I can ask uh, you questions uh, based on the chapters. The chapter uh, one, which is actually two, the hydraulic past, uh, irrigation and the state formation, where he really lays out how um, individuals at their own ability were trying to liberate themselves from this canal irrigation system, which is going on. The chapter two is uh, the rise of Colossus, where he talks about uh, how from this transition of irrigation system, we were eventually unknowingly, unintendedly leading to the turmoil of which we are now already seeing it. We, are, we have passed that stage as well. And then he, in the chapter three, he talks about the future of uh, flow irrigation, where he's trying to compare things, um, what was uh, the more centralized way and what we have done in this manner and how the development of irrigation has really outrun the administration, which he already started talking about uh, just before I uh, started talking about the chapter layout. Then chapter four talks about the wealth and welfare, which is more focused on how aligning it, uh, you know, with uh, looking at democratic ways of doing things and what was uh, needed by the people and uh, what was followed and what is this unorthodox rule, you know, where everybody was doing everything in their own way, the way they like to. So in a true democratic or free spirit, I must say, so that is covered there. Then diminishing returns, where he talk, where he gets into talking about its economic, uh, you know, impact, um, which was slowly getting visible there, and how what eventually it meant for the entire society or the country at large. Then uh, chapter six is about aquifers and institutions, where uh, the governance aspect is captured very uh, robustly, I must say, in the text, and where we were really lacking to really. Uh, understand, measure, and of course, we are still not able to manage it, but at least an attempt uh, at an institutional level was um, already getting into uh, uh, the process. And now we have some process, not completely a robust one, but the text uh, really captures that part. Chapter seven is on the um, can the anarchy be ta tamed? And that is where I also have a lot of questions uh, because um, I also question democracy to be honest in that context. And then, um, interestingly, in the conclusion chapter, he talks about uh, taking a very optimistic way and talks about how uh, thriving in anarchy. And uh, I also could feel a little bit of, you know, unrest there in the conclusion where, is this a good thriving? I mean, when individuals are better off, but the collective good is really not the better off. So this is how the chapters are laid out. So um, with your due permission, uh, I will ask, uh, ask you a few questions from each chapter. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. So um, when um, I will focus on India's experience because that's a little bit I know. Um, and post-independence, we have been a little bit unfortunate to read much about Bangladesh and Pakistan. So in the context of India's uh, groundwater status, 
in chapter one, where you're talking about this, you know, um, all of a sudden freedom, not only in the political administration context, but also in the context of water, you know, extracting my own water for my own need. And there is nobody to tell how much to extract and, you know, uh, how many times I can do that. Uh, do you really uh, feel that uh, we uh, that was somehow the beginning of losing this whole community feeling or collective feeling or you know common pool resource uh, management towards some kind of water which was actually invisible then also you know people just didn't realize that collectively we are going to uh, be at loss in the long run what's your take on that actually it's quite to the contrary yeah uh, um, i most you will be surprised how hard the governments in various provinces of india tried to promote to get farmers to start using groundwater in okay. 1930s and 40s and 50s, the main the, the way the groundwater question was, was posed was that here is a vast reservoir of unexploited source. <laughs> and there is so much of agricultural poverty in uh, in India. Yes. If only farmers started making economic use, efficient use of this groundwater, then agricultural development would be would be very, very rapid. It was it was to this end that uh, governments in Uttar Pradesh started making public tubes because private farmers were not willing to make investment okay. in uh, in bore wells and tube wells. So actually, in in one way, you can say that it was the governments which sponsored. which yes yeah, sponsored, sanctioned, even subsidized very heavily subsidized groundwater development, and that was a major concern in 1950s and 60s when India was prone to famines. The yes. main priority of the government was to increase food production, become food self-sufficient. And Mrs. Gandhi, as prime minister, you know, she promoted this inten intensive agriculture development program. And an important component of the program was developing groundwater. So the government gave all kinds of subsidies and incentives. Uh, in fact, there was a time when district magistrates, district collectors were given a quota that every month you must bore so many, uh, so many tube wells. So, you know, when we talk about the groundwater crisis today, we often forget that in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, we were actually trying very hard to get farmers to start using groundwater so that we could produce more food. And then, of course, we, we uh, uh, you know, lost the plot. And uh, once farmers realized how, realized. How, how productive this resource was and how beneficial it was for their own livelihood, uh, you know, they, the the groundwater development took on its own uh, uh, its own life, and uh, then it was hard. The the jenny was out of the bottle, and it was hard to put it back into the bottle. <laughs> yes. But therefore, one major message of this book, which is often lost, is that while we do keep uh, worrying so much about the groundwater uh, depletion and groundwater quality uh, deterioration, we often overlook the massive livelihood impact that groundwater irrigation is produced. You know, Professor Amartya, Amartya Sen says that yes. uh, famines in India are uh, a matter of the past, a matter of history, because India chose democracy. I, I would think that uh, famines became history in India because India developed groundwater. I think groundwater has had such a profound impact on food security, on agricultural growth, on smallholder livelihood, uh, that we often tend to underestimate. The, it's a different matter that we have gone overboard and yes. uh, we, have, we have now kind of, uh, you know, a, but then in, in India or South Asia in general is the only part of the world which has failed to take large segments of population out of, out of agriculture. In 1900, the average size of the land holding in India was more than three hectares. Today, the average size of land holding is less than 0.7 hectares. So you have a family of a farming farmer family of five or six who have to make a living from 0.7 hectares of land. Unless they work the land two, two and a half times every year, there is no way they can survive. So just imagine what would have happened if uh, our farmers didn't have access to groundwater irrigation. It's because of groundwater irrigation, they're able, they're able to take an additional crop in winter and a third small crop in, uh, in vegetable crop in summer. So I think the benefits of groundwater irrigation and the beneficial impact, livelihood impact that is created uh, must not be uh, underestimated. 
Yeah, I think very well uh, uh, said about it. And uh, it's also um, for so many uh, decades, we have been uh, looking at uh, things from more Anthropocene uh, um, approach, uh, where now the whole orientation is slightly uh, shifting towards, uh, you know, looking at climate change as an issue, sustainability as something to attain for. And I, I uh, in my career, I grew up in that stage where we were already talking about it, where we have to drift from the Anthropocene, you know. But I completely agree with you when uh, when you mentioned that it is definitely the main source of uh, livelihood and also the when we talk about democracy, the way it started liberating people from all kinds of worries, including the administration worries, because it was in their own control that they could draw water uh, from there. But uh, a uh, nice kind of question to you uh, related to this when our uh, government itself started, you know, uh, it's kind of uh, giving them independence of use of the water because, of course, it probably it wasn't in uh, the control of government to really take care of so much of the rising poverty. So it was more empowering in that sense. But then uh, if we stand today where we are still struggling to have enough groundwater data, uh, do you think then also they didn't realize that at some point in time they have to start documenting or, you know, gathering the data in certain manner? Because if we look at data like census and all, they have been so well organized uh, ever since we have started making census. But then when groundwater was kind of a state sponsored event and it has um, helped to get a lot of people out of uh, their problems, uh, uh, where did we really not realize that it was required to measure or, you know, monitor it properly so that it can be managed uh, in, in future? Do, uh, do you think in those days, those predictive studies used to happen? And then was groundwater even studied in those times uh, that much as it is studied today? So I think that one major shift that has occurred, and, uh, and I think that is something to do with the transition from... Uh, uh, from uh, uh, large surface irrigation systems to groundwater systems. Yes. Is that if you look at the water studies or irrigation studies of 1970s and 80s and 90s, the by far the most important perspective was techno-economic. Yes. How do you design irrigation projects and you know economics of irrigation projects? You didn't. You didn't have any uh, many studies or uh, you didn't have sociologists. Uh, in yeah. the water debate. You didn't have political scientists in the water debate. There was no political economy perspective. Yes. But one major implication of the groundwater development is that political economy has been brought into boat relief because the entire the groundwater uh, revolution has occurred, has been driven by political economy contribution. You know, yes. Today, for example, uh, the energy subsidies that uh, support yes. uh, groundwater, it's basically a political economy. See, every chief minister is trying to get out of the energy subsidies which are making their electricity utilities bankrupt. Yes. And yet, and yet they are not able to get out of it simply because so many, such a large number of farmers depend on yes, um, uh, or benefit from those subsidies. And they made it a political issue you know, every, before every election. Uh, energy tariff, uh, energy pricing yes. for agriculture becomes a big issue. So I think the nature of the discourse has changed. Uh, and so has, uh, uh, so have the, as the focus of scholarship on uh, uh, water yes. scholarship. On, on uh, understanding and studying groundwater, yes, I think there is a great deal more focus today on uh, understanding groundwater than was the case in uh, uh, in in the in the first fifty years of after independence, but we started the first minor irrigation census counting tube wells uh, way back in nineteen eighty nine, and since okay. then every five years we have a minor irrigation census. The latest one, I think eighth, seventh, or eighth, uh, that just got completed, and we have some early results. So I think the government has a government of India at least has been uh, uh, trying to keep track of how the way the groundwater economy has been, has been moving. But that's quite different from monitoring every tube, yes. you know, regist registering every farmer and measuring how much uh, water he, he or she pumps out every month and then giving them quota. These are the sort of things that were sought to be done in countries like Mexico, in Spain, yes. in the United States, in Australia. And so, so that kind of individual monitoring of farmers 
uh, has never taken place anywhere in uh, South Asia, not even in China, which is a major groundwater uh, groundwater yes, economy. Yes. And the main reason is that the numbers involved are so large, and the average ticket size is so small that it just doesn't make sense yes. to to kind of keep a tab on every every gun. So, per force, we have to use indirect ways of yes. influencing farmers' behavior. We cannot influence our farmers' behavior in the same way as Americans and Australians. Yes. We need to figure out smarter ways, uh, indirect ways of, of doing that. Yeah, interesting because uh, I'm just trying to interweave between what's going on today and what is in the book. So I'm returning to the book again here in, in uh, one of the chapter in chapter, chapter two and three. I, I will uh, ask a combined question from there where you are talking about how slowly without... Uh, uh, you know, realizing because these were individual actions, the transition to uh, tube wells and bore wells were really leading us to kind of a turmoil in the irrigation system in Asia. And in there, you also talk about how, uh, uh, you know, the irrigation system was outrun uh, in the administration procedure, which uh, you are now saying that we are much better, of course, with the advancement of uh, technology and administration on water governance also we are bound to be better off. But in the book, when you talk about how individual appropriation, uh, you know, um, furthered uh, the even surpassing the anarchy because people uh, were even uh, had started uh, wasting water. I mean, they were using more water than it is than they even required. So, uh, what's your take on this now? I mean, if 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 I link it with today, where we still face this problem of economies of scale, um, if we compare with America and Spain and all, where everything is still monitored, as they say, uh, but I have it not read it. Uh, uh, in this situation of economies of scale, how how do we really? Uh, uh, consider uh, it to be administered in the future as well. I mean, now we have some data, good data actually in non groundwater in 30 years. So I, it, I, I think that it will never be easy for us to <clears throat> manage individuals' use of groundwater uh, as they do in, uh, uh, in, the, in the new world, simply because of the organization of the of the groundwater economy. But the key point that I'm making in chapter two and chapter three is that the development of groundwater, uh, uh, groundwater economy of India has actually spelled the doom of yes. the irrigation system. There has been, uh, it's a zero-sum game that, yes. uh, uh, you know, it's a state like Punjab, which in 1950s, 90% uh, of its irrigation was from surface canal. You know, it's, yes, it's, it's such a large, mm. a large canal network uh, in which the British invested and then we invested mm. in it. And yet today, 95, 90% of uh, Punjab's irrigation comes from tube wells. So I think having an independent source uh, of irrigation in the, under their own control has actually driven farmers away from community managed uh, and state and public government managed irrigation sources. So what has happened to canal systems in North India has also happened to irrigation tanks in Tamil Nadu, in uh, yes. Andhra Pradesh, in Telangana. So all the earlier irrigation structures that we had, which are based on surface, uh, surface water flow, they have been, I mean, the groundwater development has been predatory in the sense yes. that uh, in the sense that it is actually eaten into the share where the farmers have depended less and begun to depend less and less on, on those sources. And this has led to the decline of public yes. and community irrigation system. So groundwater irrigation, the growth in groundwater irrigation has occurred peri passu with decline in, uh, in surface irrigation system. Now in many states, uh, the political leaders are now looking again at the surface irrigation systems, not as primary providers of irrigation, but as, as structures which can actually recharge the aquifers yes. uh, and, and service in, in some ways service groundwater, the groundwater economy. So yes. Gujarat, for example, you know, in the last 20 years yes. has invested big time in, uh, you know, digging up the ponds all over again, you know, uh, desilting the canals and check dams and percolation ponds and so on and so forth. So that the amount of recharge increases, which farmers can. So 
our approach to making groundwater economy sustainable has so far been primarily supply side. You know, uh, Maharashtra started this pro this uh, this program of uh, what is it called? You know, digging up the the canal river courses and so on and so forth. Um, Telangana KCR had this program called Mission Kakatya, under yes. which forty eight thousand tanks, uh, Kakatya tanks were revived. Why not so much because they provided direct irrigation to farmers, because, but because they recharged yes. aquifers that. Uh, uh, you know, which on which farmers' groundwater irrigation depended. So I think the same structures which had been consigned to disuse are now finding new uses in support of uh, of the groundwater economy. Now this is a distinct, uh, you know, uh, development in um, uh, in southern parts of South Asia. Nowhere else in the world has such a large uh, commitment of resources and energy. Has occurred has been given to reviving traditional irrigation structures in the service of the groundwater economy. Yes. In in the, in the advanced base, the focus is much more on demand management. But in in south of India and in India, the focus in the last 10, 15 years by every chief minister has been on improving groundwater recharge through rehabilitating old canals and tank structures. So this has yes. been a very unique uh, aspect of the groundwater economy of, of South Asia. Yeah, th that's a very interesting perspective to look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, groundwater in uh, more, uh, I will say, uh, as, a more, uh, as a bigger service provider. But anyway, in India, we are now 70 to 80 percent uh, using groundwater for irrigation and domestic purposes. And when you say that surface water is uh, getting used to service the groundwater, uh, in that scale. And uh, I mean, I, I recall uh, getting a little bit of exposure to these Manrega schemes where it was massively, you know, they were doing all kinds of digging everywhere, left, right, and center. The country was digging everywhere to do groundwater recharge. Having said that, uh, uh, we, uh, we still have to look at the way we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, extracting groundwater. And in your book, you do write about uh, the unorthodox route to water security. And I think that's a comparison when you are, where you are talking about, you know, uh, how uh, the other countries have approached and how we have managed to, to large extent, liberate our uh, problems or liberate ourselves in taking this route of groundwater uh, watered uh, economy. In that sense, um, when you uh, when you um, write about these things and uh, and then you get into this hydropolitics of uh, you know large scale surface water ir irrigation system vis-a-vis, -vis, I will say decentralized uh, groundwater irrigation system. Uh, 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 where do you see now the politics lie? Because you are very clearly saying that there is the impetus is more on feeding the groundwater through the surface water now. And uh, we still have uh, both the water boards as different entities in the country, you know, for, for that matter. How do you see that they are actually uh, really working in tandem uh, or in a more integrated way, the way water looks more complementarity? in terms of uh, surface water and groundwater. Are the institutions are also inclined in that way in terms of uh, integration or complementarity? No, they aren't. <laughs> that's and a that's problem. A, that's, actually, that's a, that's a big challenge. Uh, uh, in the irrigation uh, literature, there is a great focus laid on conjunctive management of surface and groundwater. There yeah. is conjunctive use of surface and groundwater, and there is conjunctive management of surface and groundwater. Con by conjunctive management, what we mean is managing the entire surface irrigation system as well as the groundwater uh, economy of its command in such a manner that both the resources uh, are, are optimally used and they kind of you know work in tandem with, e with each other. But with the rise of the groundwater economy, the, the entire uh, role of surface irrigation management is declined. If you look at irrigation departments in most of the, most of the states of India, they have kind of been depleted. Uh, there are many states have, have, they have not hired irrigation engineers for 25 years. So they, basically the politicians have realized that irrigation occurs primarily through groundwater and the surface irrigation systems, you know, they basically don't contribute much to. 
with the, with that in a state like Gujarat, for example, which is Sardar Sarovar Dam and the canal yes. system, you have so few engineers. And uh, I was told that by in the next five years, almost every engineer in the irrigation department is going to retire. And then there'll be no irrigation department. So the very important task of managing surface water and groundwater in a conjunctive mode is kind of is happening, but it's happening by default. Nobody is making any effort to do that systematically. And I think that's that's one area in which major gains can be made uh, in, uh, in, in the times to come. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are also other issues. I think um, energy subsidies have emerged as the major driver of, yes. uh, uh, of groundwater. And therefore, the nexus, you know, what we call the water and energy, food, environment yes. nexus, has actually emerged as, uh, <clears throat> as the playing field of, uh, of water politics. Yes, and you 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 talked about about water politics, but I do I think now these days there is no canal irrigation or large surface irrigation projects. Uh, they hardly attract any attention of the yeah. <laughs> Yes, but uh, groundwater irrigation and the energy subsidies and the, the 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 nexus between energy and groundwater is the hotbed of uh, of. Uh, of water politics, and it comes into play before every election. Every election, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the groundwater lobby has now become so powerful that uh, they can dictate terms to to chief minister, which is the which is the reason why no state in India today uh, can, has the courage to meter tube bills, and if, even if they want to give subsidy to farmers on energy, the measured subsidy on meter consumption. So every state has, you know, unmetered tube wells with flat tariff, and I think this is an, again a unique feature of the of the groundwater economy of uh, of South Asia. Now, do you think that uh, just a question uh, coming uh, spontaneously from what you said, because linking it with the hydropolitics of uh, energy uh, groundwater, um, because energy is kind of a proxy to groundwater. You know, it's it's used that way. Uh, to uh, you know, get votes uh, to large extent. What will be the energy price and all, and uh, that uh, indirectly uh, tells how much uh, water is getting appropriated and how much is allowed. I mean, of course, there is no cap on uh, how much is allowed, but still, the energy prices indirectly uh, you know tell what's going on in the groundwater politics. Uh, when uh, when we look at these kind of things and when we see that uh, individuals and uh, groups uh, share uh, aquifer at many places and of course they are interrelated, we also are looking at, uh, uh, I will say this as an uncontrolled growth, uh, which you also capture in the unorthodox route in your, uh, uh, when you talk about that, uh, you also um, cover this little aspect here. Uh, so, um, uh, do you think, to large extent, because it, uh, even it is indirect now through energy that groundwater is promoted, indirectly through surface water uh, constructions, uh, we are promoting groundwater use, saying that surface water is going to uh, feed the groundwater or recharge the groundwater. I would say that uh, from independence till uh, t even till date, in, uh, implicitly there is still a promotion for groundwater use, either um, by no choice, that we have no choice than to use groundwater. But do you think it is uh, uh, really right in, uh, in, let's say, if we look at things when we were already discussing the day zero uh, for India, for many places in the country, uh, how far can we uh, really continue uh, promoting groundwater? I'm say using the word promoting, which you don't use, of course, in the book, but I'm just uh, putting it in the current context and layperson language uh, because energy subsidies, uh, supporting uh, large scale infrastructures uh, to revive groundwater in a way is also talking about, okay, please continue using groundwater. How far do you think we can go in this manner? Or uh, do we have to really start uh, you know, taking a step back and start thinking about Alternatives to groundwater, which is of course surface water, is there. But uh, from moving from eighty percent, I, I really don't know. Back. So, so Mansi, I think we are in a catch twenty two situation. I yes. think that uh, um, 
I think every chief minister would find would like to find a way of uh, putting a cap on uh, yes uh, groundwater draft and the energy subsidies because energy subsidies to farmers to agriculture are actually bleeding yes. the economy. You know, other than the four distribution companies in Gujarat, all of ninety distribution electricity distribution companies in India, they're losing money. And the main reason why they're losing money is farmer subsidies. Yes. What one fifth of the power that we generate goes into pumping groundwater. So actually, in the groundwater economy, the even from the environmental point of view, energy is becoming a greater concern than water. Than water. I I think that uh, you know I, I, India is not uh, like Middle East. You know, we get our four thousand cubic meters of rainfall every every year. Uh, and therefore, uh, if we are able to slow down the groundwater uh, use uh, in uh, uh, in some years to come, chances are that we'll be able to you know get back strike back our original pre-development equilibrium, which is not possible for say countries like Egypt or in the Middle East, which are dependent on fossil groundwater. But the real issue in our groundwater economy is the energy. The economic implications of energy subsidies, the environmental and climate implications of uh, using thermal energy in uh, in groundwater use, uh, in a manner that uh, you know uh, six, seven, five, six, seven percent of our um, GHG emissions uh, yeah. can be traced back to the groundwater uh, groundwater economy. So cleaning up that part of the economy is also a major challenge. If you look. You know, on the global groundwater scene, you find that, uh, con- that there, there are basically, globally there are three groundwater sub economies. One, there are countries like Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Punjab, Pakistan, Sindh, Nepal, Tarai, where the groundwater economy is energized primarily by oil. Majority of farmers there use diesel pumps or Morocco or Yemen. These are the countries where the groundwater economy is predominantly energized by by oil. These are not regulated. However, uh, the groundwater economy is here here differently from the other. The second major sub-economy is groundwater economy driven, powered by electricity but the tube wells are registered and regulated. If you look at the United States, Europe, yes. Spain, Italy, uh, China, uh, you know, these countries where there is large groundwater draft, but it's drafted, is done by farmers who are registered, tube wells which are metered, and farmers have to pay a consumption linked energy charge. Yes. Now, in these two sub economies, uh, you know, there was this, this economist who would say, it, I think, 15, 20 years ago, that groundwater overdraft is automatically self-terminating. Why? Because he said that when you when farmers over, over-pump groundwater, the water table go, goes down. And as water table goes down, the pumping depth increases, the cost of lifting groundwater increases. increases. And, at some, and at some stage, energy cost itself makes irrigation uneconomic. Hmm. This is what happens in sub-economy one and sub-economy two that I described. There is a third sub-economy in which groundwater is drawn primarily through electric pumps, pump owners who are who either use stolen power or you use free power, who are non-metered. Now, this includes countries like India. This includes uh, Baluchistan in Pakistan, Northwest Frontier Province in, it includes Mexico, it includes Iran, these are the countries where farmers have organized into power block, into powerful uh, you know, unions, and they have prevented governments from metering tubeless, and they keep extracting subsidies which are not measured. These are the energy irrigation nexus hot bits. This is where the, the water and energy nexus uh, plays out in the most perverse manner. And I think the groundwater energy problem can be solved simultaneously only by cracking this nexus. That yes. actually is the burden of the of the last chapter of yes. my book. Yeah. So uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, this nexus, uh, you also mentioned in your book, uh, in, in the context of India, let me just say that there, and there is an order in anarchy. 
you know and uh, and when you were giving this example that how they have or self organized themselves to really put a political pressure uh, on uh, the system that uh, they will be using ground water in different way so in in book you write that in india the choice could never be between chaos and stability but between manageable and unmanageable chaos between humane and inhuman anarchy and between tolerable and intolerable disorder so when we look at situations like india where you talked about the third sub economy approach and uh, where we are still seeing uh, that in the energy sector there is lot of uh, you know impetus in the energy sector with keeping uh, ground water in of course at in the high side uh um, where do you think that uh, we uh, we are really in in a stage of really uh, taking little bit more control over the way groundwater is extracted in india because in last chapter you do talk about uh, uh you call thriving in anarchy you know so that's quite uh, um, interesting to see and because in in the sense where you talk about uh, thriving in anarchy uh there is a sense of optimism but at the same time you also alarm about uh, you know bringing more institutional approach uh, to looking at groundwater management even it has to even if it has to come through you know other ways let's say energy for that matter so i will just take your comments in the last part of the book and maybe then we open it for people if they have any questions to ask so so manchi i think <clears throat> I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the drivers of this groundwater boom in South Asia are very different from yes. the drivers in uh, uh, in uh, you know the new economy countries. Uh, I think one reason why the uh, farmers are so desperate uh, to use groundwater is because um, their livelihood. depends on it and yes. if they don't if they don't do that then uh, uh, they'll be forced into poverty so i think there is a long term answer to the groundwater crisis which is to shift population out of agriculture yes of farm livelihood you know china has already started doing that china has a campaign called close the wells abandon the land so they are using state authority basically to just force farmers out of agriculture and moving them to eco cities or ecological uh, cities because they think that as long as farmers are forced to uh, you know grow food for for their survival they will keep using groundwater so uh, the only long term way in which we can do that and in the, in in other countries in south asia this will happen through the natural process of economic growth if we could move people out of agriculture like say Uh, south east asian countries did uh, much better than we we are doing then over 40 50 years as uh, you know instead of today uh, 55 60 crore people depend on agriculture if tomorrow just just 15 15 crore people depend on agriculture then the average land owning would be 4 3 4 5 hectares and people will not be under pressure those farmers will not be under pressure to take 3 4 5 crops every year from the land the demand for groundwater will will kind of decrease so that is one part of the answer i don't think that is going to help in the near term because we are not going to be able to move people out of agriculture so rapidly but there are studies which uh, and analysis which show that the current groundwater economy is very inefficient as you yourself mentioned we use a lot more groundwater in agriculture than we need to yes so there is a study that we did uh, some analysis that we did in the emit ada program which showed that even if you take 20 Twenty-five percent of the groundwater irrigation out of agriculture, uh, we would not have any reduction in India's food production. Yes, it just shows that we basically use water inefficiently, and that is because uh, water is, you know, energy is available free. You know, yes, it's, it's, so farmers. That's the rerouting no, problem. Mm. Yeah, there is no need for farmers to. So if we figure out uh, ways in which farmers are forced to economize or incentivize to economize. on groundwater to make to use groundwater more efficiently uh, without necessarily without in any way reducing their their food production or their income uh, then you can create a more more efficient uh, groundwater economy and there have been some experiments uh, in uh, in india i don't know if you have heard about jyotigram 
Yes, and Jyoti Grand, the Gujarat project, and you also mentioned uh, elaborate elaborate uh, that in the book as well. So I was coming yeah. to that as an example. Yes. Yeah. So the basic premise of of that is that the farmer's need for power is is need for water. Yes. If, if, if farmer has, has water, if you can give farmer water when he needs, he won't need the power. Yes. But right. But right now, the only way he can get groundwater is by using power. Power. So if you if you recreate the supply system of power in such a manner that he gets as much power that he wants during the peak irrigation period, and you then whittle down his power ration during the rest of the year, then you can save power, you can save water, and you can actually you know in some way cap put a cap on groundwater drought as well as any. So Gujarat tried this. It at yes. Jyoti Gram it separated agricultural feeders. And then it put eight hour power ration. Farmer, every farmer gets eight hours of power every day during the day one week and during the night the next week. And this has been going on for um, for now yep. nearly twenty years. Yes. And, stu- and studies have shown that this has actually reduced the subsidy burden. This has reduced energy use in agriculture. This has reduced or capped the overall overall groundwater drought. So without losing farmers' income, without losing farmers' political support, you are able to kind of bring in certain amount of uh, amount of efficiency in. Uh, you know, now the, the new solar pump, solar energy used in that creates other opportunities. And again, Gujarat has you know uh, done a pilot, a small pilot in which uh, I don't know if you've heard about that. I spoke about that in the Gandhinagar. Yes, I do remember that. Huh? Yeah, so that is another another way that you are not actually hitting directly the interests of farmers. The farmer also actually gains by saving water and 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 energy. Uh, so I think that what will work in our setting are indirect strategies like this, which do not try to regulate individual farmers' behavior, but which create new systems, which replace existing systems by new systems, which uh, incentivize farmer to increase the efficiency in the use of energy and water. Really, that is uh, what you are talking about, thriving in anarchy, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there has to be certain uh, institutional framework or, you know, some implicit system where we can regulate or not regulate, but uh, check uh, the use of groundwater, but at the same time are uh, not really hurting uh, the means of uh, livelihood of the farmers. But uh, if it, if this process can actually control their excess of 20-25% of groundwater, which is unrequired and yet extracted. I think we uh, we can really uh, do wonders in groundwater management. And uh, the way uh, you also mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, thriving in anarchy in, in that sense, it looks, sounds quite optimistic. Uh, but it requires a lot of behavioral change. I do remember where most of the talk in our Gandhinagar conference was about how to bring that behavioral change. And I do recall a lot of work done at EMI and FES, I am referring to where a lot of game theories are played on the ground, you know, where uh, engaging people and then monitoring them for uh, many years. Uh, and I see Shilp is also here. So he's involved extensively in doing those games with uh, local communities to uh, do these things. So I think I will stop here, but I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. Maybe we take a couple of questions from the participants here. If they have any questions for you or any comments or any suggestions uh, or anything you would like to add to this conversation. So please raise your hand or just unmute yourself and start uh, the conversation. Over to you, to all the participants. Fazia, do you want to go? Yeah, I was just waiting for others, you know, if they had any question. Thank you very much, uh, Tushar, sir. I think it was wonderful. A lot of my questions already got answered during this conversation. I just wanted to also understand from you, there is a government policy because you spoke about water energy uh, nexus and food water energy nexus. Uh, there is a government policy, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, where they're taking up farms, you know, they're taking up farms from the farmers and uh, converting them into solar farms. Uh, how do you think that's going to impact agriculture, water? But at the same time, I have read stories where these farms have come up and there were landless farmers who used to work on those land and make money. And now they have lost their livelihood. So how do you see it interplay in the long run, the water, food, energy nexus? 
So I know right now you probably know that there is a government of India, very ambitious scheme of government of India called Kusum. Yes. And mm-hmm. the Kusum scheme is essentially about promoting solar energy in, uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. in, in irrigation. And Kusum has three components. And I think one of these components is very promising, but uh, kind of. Uh, so the first co- component A includes what you are suggesting that uh, yes, mm-hmm. you know creating uh, building uh, large scale megawatt scale solar plants and uh, energize at the at the near the substations and then energizing agricultural feeders using solar energy from uh, generating those uh, the second is solarizing standalone tubes that is uh, tubes which are not connected to, to the grid and the third is component c is a, a component based on this pilot in Gujarat called Sky, in which farmers who had grid connected tubes are now solarized and they are given a 25 year power purchase guarantee. So, farmers actually, those farmers now grow solar energy on the field. They use whatever they need for their irrigation needs, but they sell the surplus to the government at a very remunerative price. In Gujarat, they sell it at three and a half rupees per unit. So there are 4,500 tube wells which have been solarized thus under this pilot called Sky. And I think that this is ideal for creating a better balance in the energy food food nexus because it incentivizes farmer uh, to both save energy as well as, uh, as, well as groundwater. And uh, there is no loss of livelihood for the farmer, but the government saves uh, big time on energy subsidies. Uttarakhand has uh, has a program. Uttarakhand is the only state which has actually implemented a program in which entire farm has been taken over uh, to create uh, create a solar. But I think it's early days yet, and uh, I don't think there is this scheme has uh, has really made uh, big headway. Maybe Shilpas may have some more information on that. Uh, sir, I think in Karnataka also because Karnataka, I had read the story about Karnataka, where you know the land had been taken away and uh, to build this farm. So. They were, of course, winners, the farmers who gave their land and they are getting some kind of income uh, because they've leased their land to the government. But then the uh, or the discom uh, this thing. But there are farmers who like farm laborers who used to make livelihood out of working in those farms. And now they have completely lost their livelihood. So that's the kind of uh, imbalance that we see. Uh, the other things are, in fact, uh, if there's no questions from others, the leading, uh, like from what you have said, just a follow up question on that, because I'm aware of this other scheme also, which isn't really with renewable energy, but uh, Pani, uh, what? Pani Bachao Paise Kamao, which is in Punjab scheme. Yeah. So I'm aware of that scheme also, which sort of works on a similar model that you said. But yeah. here it's not through solar, but uh, they get a quota and then they do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but I see that these also come with their own set of challenges uh, with regard yeah. to who we are incentivizing. Right. A lot of uh, these farms, you know, they it's the it's actually on sharecropping and uh, there are uh, people who are taking, but the incentives land up with the landowners. So how can we make such incentivization fair? Uh, I know I'm asking for too much, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think there are challenges around that as well. Have yeah, you come across something like that, sir? Yeah, yeah. No, we've been following up on this uh, Pani Bachao, Paisa Bachao, Pani Bachao, Paisa Banao scheme uh, very closely. And I think that Amy has actually done a study. And uh, and and you're right that uh, uh, there are farmers who have multiple tube bills and uh, you know, some, some of the tube bills are connected to the scheme and others are not. So they can use the others to do their continue pumping groundwater as as before, and use the first one to uh, to actually collect money from the electricity board for savings. So this kind of uh, thing happens. So I think the design of the scheme is extremely important. Uh, these the schemes must be so designed that they do not inflict losses on the landless and the poor, like you mentioned in in uh, in Kana. In fact, in the in Karnataka, this original scheme was very similar to Gujarat. But they offered a very attractive uh, feed-in tariff of more than nine rupees per unit, and this was such an attractive proposition that farmers decided to bring all the land under uh, uh, under under solar uh, uh, under solar solar. So the government had to had to abandon the scheme. So there is only one feeder today in Karnataka, uh, you know, which has been solarized on this uh, this banner. So I think the design of the scheme. Uh, 
and constantly monitoring it so that uh, you know it, the social costs uh, are are within limits is the answer to, to that because whenever you create incentives there will always be uh, you know people will try to kind of uh, you know defeat the uh, the purpose thank you so much sir thanks a lot you are muted Thank you, Fazia. Thanks for the questions. Uh, if there are any questions for sir or any comments or suggestions, we will take it. Uh, and till you are thinking about it, let me just announce the next week's uh, uh, sessions. So the next Friday Water Season Thesis Club, where we invite a PhD scholar or just uh, completed P, um, uh, PhD scholar, and we next Friday, which is 16th of uh, June, we are discussing impact of riverfront development on ecology of riverine landscape. And the case is of Sabarmati River, and the scholar we have is Priyanka Kanhare. Um, the next Wednesday is for water, which is our regular scientific uh, sessions, uh, is on June 14th. And uh, usually the second week of every month, we are taking biodiversity series with Saki Waters. And the next uh, Wednesday, which, uh, we discuss coral reef ecosystem and underwater paradise, and we look at the conservation threats uh, and uh, you know, opportunities of it. So uh, as you're aware, we are doing Monday munching with Women for Water, Wednesdays for Water, and the Friday Waters, which we are here today. Uh, we really thank you uh, from the entire team of w for w Foundation to make these water conversations meaningful. And do keep checking our website, www.w4w.in. And uh, maybe now, if there are any questions or any comments, I can take them as the, as the last uh, bit of it, or uh, we can really take the opportunity to say uh, really a uh, big thank you to Tushar sir for taking time um, for us and also uh, doing this conversation in such a you know open manner you know uh, and taking us through uh, the time when India got independence when people were getting independence in the water through the groundwater uh, I will say democratization of uh, uh, through tube wells and all and to the state where we are today and where we can go further of course, we are seeing that the farming is uh, decreasing in the country in terms of percentage. But uh, what uh, you were talking about to achieve a stage where farming really gets not only increase, uh, decrease, but at the same time, land holding gets increased where it becomes possible to regulate groundwater in more uh, efficient way. But uh, distant dream. Uh, but I think we have better options, as you rightly mentioned in the book, as unorthodox way of doing things. And I think we are much more self-organized in doing these kind of approaches. And I hope that we will have more uh, ways to really tackle our groundwater crisis and get people uh, get into that behavioral change through these kind of scientific events, which um, are taken care of by organizations like EMI and many other organizations in the country. So we really thank Tushar, sir, uh, for this time and also for this conversation. Thank you so much, sir. It was really enriching for me to really get in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansi. Thank you Thanks so much. Here.